and welcome everyone to our IUN Community Garden session with Kipton Walton. So a little bit about Kipton, he has been worked at the Indiana Dunes National Park for roughly 28 years. He is currently serving as a park ranger and outreach program coordinator for the park. Kipton loves birding in the park and taking groups on hikes in the dunes. Miller Woods is one of his favorite places to hike and work. Kipton, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and begin the presentation. Thank you for having me. And just to kind of talk about the dunes themselves and, and my job and what I do um, and why I love it so much is the diversity. So when I um, came to this area from college, um, that's what I noticed. The area is so diverse um, with the different kind of people that, that are here. And that gives rise to um, the diversity in the area because all the way back to the Native Americans that lived here, the Potawatomi, the Miami, the Iroquois, the Illini living in this area, um, the reason they were able to live in this area and, and thrive is because on the southern shores of Lake Michigan there where we sit, we have that diversity. We have the flora and the fauna from the north, south, east, and west converging there. And because of the geology in the area, we get these extraordinary plants um, and animals that, that uh, make the dunes their, their home. Um, and the dunes, as you guys know, were created by, um, by glaciers over um, 14, 15,000 years ago, um, what we call the Wisconsin glacial era uh, during that time. But just to kind of continue with that, um, going through Northwest Indiana from um, the Douglas Center, which is located in Gary, which is at the far west end of the park, all the way east to um, Pinnock Bog, which is in um, the Pines or the Michigan City area. So almost right on the Michigan border, you've got great diversity. As you can see on the map here, the park stretches from, from Gary um, in, in the far west, all the way east to Michigan City. It's um, well over 15,000 acres, uh, about 22 miles from, from Michigan City to Gary. And in between there, you, if you look on the map, everything in, in green is the national park. And the brown area is the state park. And the state park came before the national park we were established in 1966. But as I was saying at the beginning, you can see that um, right there, we're, we sit on like the saddle there. And it's it's the the, the um, southern shores of Lake Michigan and the flora and fauna are so diverse there. So, yeah, so um, diversity. I mean, that's extremely important to our lives, as I said before. And this picture here is, is showing Pinhook Bog, which is one of the most unique, um, if not one of the most diverse areas in the park. Miller Woods. <clears throat> is is one of my favorite ecosystems and that's what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go through the different ecosystems and talk about them a little bit and this is a fall picture and you can see um, the oak savanna and the wetland that is um, there that we have a little bridge that goes across the wetland there and these wetlands um, are great producers um, they produce areas for lots of macro invertebrates which are on the the bottom of the food chain so in fact, this area is um, the um, headwaters of the Grand Calumet River. And so that goes into, into Chicago. And so in these headwaters, you get lots of in, um, um, endangered uh, fish species and insects as well. In fact, we do a dragonfly monitoring program and that hits a lot of the areas here in Miller Woods and, and surrounding areas of Miller Woods because of the, um, the importance of of the dragonflies that we have in the area. Now, as you guys know, none of these areas are immune to uh, global change. You know, with you know the global global warming issues and things that we're having, um, it's just one of those things that we're trying to monitor and trying to keep um, the oak savanna um, alive. You get, and I hate to have this happen, but as the um, as things dry up, and, and we we are noticing that our ponds, um, interdunal ponds, are drying up quicker, uh, the water's not lasting quite as long. Sometimes um, we're going to lose 
uh, species like beaver. This happens to be a beaver lodge um, just right near um, my office. And that's one of the other things that I didn't mention before is a lot of people, you know, they're like, oh, I got to go into the office. I'm not that person. I'm the person that's like, cool, I get to go into the office. I've seen from my office window, I've seen beaver swimming. Um, I've seen um, huge, in fact, just a few weeks ago, I saw huge um, bucks in velvet. Um, sitting um, underneath my window, uh, wild turkeys. I've seen hawks come down and take squirrels out of the tree that's outside of my window. It, it's just amazing. Sometimes I don't get work done because, <laughs> because I'm so busy, um, you know, looking at the wildlife and, and just and enjoying it. So as you move out, move away from the oak savanna, um, we're going to kind of move from west to east um, through the park for the most part. Um, you get into what people kind of assume or think of when they think of Indiana Dunes National Park or Indiana Dunes State Park for that matter. It's the dunes themselves, right? And Lake Michigan. And it, so it's a different ecosystem and you can see it looks drier, which it is um, because the substrate is completely different than it is um, or a lot different than it is um, in the Oak Savannah ecosystem. We've got a substrate of, of, of sand. And remember I had said earlier, um, this whole region was created by glaciers um, 14 to 15,000 years ago. And that process ground up these boulders that were pushed down and rocks and substrate that was pushed down by the glaciers and ground up as it was coming down. And then the process created the sand by um, those glaciers melting and over hundreds of thousands of years, um, those, those rocks being tumbled in, 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 the, um, in the water of, uh, of the Great Lakes, of what now is the Great Lakes. Um, creating the sand. And that process is still going on today. Um, those rocks are still being tumbled and, and fresh sand, um, not at the rate that we want, but fresh sand gets put on, on the beaches every day. So you can see um, in this picture here, overlooking um, the parking lot of West Beach. We're at West Beach and you can see remnants of the oak savanna there as well. Um, but then you have this open dune area. Now, a lot of this open dune area that you see is, was created by man. Um, the parking lot was created, uh, obviously. And then um, in the 30s, this area was sand mined. So it got mined so that they could build um, uh, windows and skyscrapers and things like that in Chicago. So um, a lot of this is, is, is man-made. Um, but then you also have the dunes that are there. And we're going to talk a little bit about dune stabilization in a little, in a little bit. Yeah, that dune stabilization is awesome because you can kind of get to the higher elevations as you can see here. And I don't know how well you guys can see this, but this picture I took, you can see the bathhouse. But then if you look on the horizon there, you can actually see Chicago. And um, so this is one of the most one of the places that people come. We get the majority of our visitors, which we get um, two to three million visitors a year they go to the beaches. Um, and uh, this is why they go to the beaches. It's beautiful, but they don't see the rest of the park. And that's hopefully what I can talk to you guys a little bit, little bit about as we go through um, the rest of the slide program today. So right along the, the beach there, we have different communities or different ecosystems. You have these wet areas that um, the water table comes up. And so you have sedges and even sometimes reeds and rushes that, that grow um, in these little pockets where the dunes protect um, protect from the lake, but then also you have the little what we call interdunal ponds. And those um, those stay stay wet. Um, sometimes they, they do dry up a little bit, but they stay wet enough for these um, uh, semi-aquatic plants to to um, to grow and, and thrive there. And again, during the, the wettest part of the season, a great place for macaron vertebrates, um, amphibians, frogs and toads, salamanders, things like that to, um, to do their thing, to reproduce. So the reason why you have those dune ridges um, and the dune and swale is because of pr what we call primary dune stabilizers. And I think when people come to the beach or come to that area, um, the main primary dune stabilizer that they notice is the grass. Um, Marum grass is one of those. And this is a um, Marum grass here in, in 
the background, there's some little uh, blue stem that we have as well. And there's other grasses um, and, and things that grow too. But the marim grass is one of those grasses that have adapted to um, that substrate, that sandy, porous substrate um, where water percolates through very quickly, nutrients is low, um, and they've got to grab that and stabilize themselves. And in doing that, they stabilize the dune as well. So you get these nice lush clumps, and those are important. Um, when people are walking to the beach, they don't really know, and we put up signs and things like that to stay on the trail, but they don't realize that when they are walking on those, those grasses, um, their sh shallow root systems sometimes are exposed, and as it get trampled on, the grass dies. When the grass dies, then there's nothing to stabilize the, the dune itself, and the dune blows away. And so we're in a constant battle. Our resource management team and interp team are in a constant battle to try to figure out how to um, protect the dunes. Um, these common grasses that you he see here, even um, endangered species like the pitcher's thistle and others that grow in the dunes and only grow there, um, how do we protect that? How do we, you know, how do we uh, reach out to people and explain to them, yeah, this is your park. Um, it's beautiful, but you can't trample all over it. And you would think people would know that, right? You think, okay, people see the trail. But I think we have, as humans, we have this um, just in our bodies, just innate want to go and explore. So you see a dune ridge and you're like, I got to get to the top of that dune ridge, whether there's grass growing on it or not. Um, people just, you know, they like to climb, they like to do things. And unfortunately, when they do that, do their exploring and things like that, it, um, it wrecks the dunes um, and kills lots of our, our plants. Another, um, what we call primary dune stabilizer that, um, that we see along the dunes as well, uh, throughout the dunes is cottonwood trees. Cottonwood trees have adapted to living um, in this area very, very well. Um, they like to live in disturbed areas. They do very well in disturbed areas and these shifting sandy soils, um, they do quite well in um, for the most part. Some of the reasons why they can do so well is because they have these thick waxy leaves. And as you all know, um, you know, all plants, they, they excess water is, is um, transferred uh, from their, their leaves and, and things through transpiration. Well, those thick waxy leaves helps stop that transpiration, slow that transpiration down. Um, and it also stops predators and uh, things like insects and things from, from infesting it, the tree as well. So the root system is one of those root systems that's kind of unique where they can uh, get themselves a foothold down in, in, in the soil and suck up the nutrients and the moisture that it needs and hold it in those leaves. And then if, this, if it switches and changes and roots are exposed for a, a period of time, those roots can, can actually turn into branches and, and leaves can grow um, or the branches can stay viable for a long time till it gets covered again and boom, it will start to um, uh, make, uh, um, collect that nutrients again. So it's a very hardy plant that grows well in the dunes and a lot of different animals um, use the root systems and all, all, obviously the, the leaves uh, and the tree itself uh, for a home. This is one of my favorites and this is actually edible. It's called a sand cherry. Um, and it's another one of those that grows in clumps. So it's providing shelter, food um, and an area for animals to, to stay. And, and doing so, it, it stabilizes the dune as well. You can see this sand cherry is sitting there um, kind of over the dune and, and it is stabilizing it along with the marim grass. And in the fall, there's beautiful cherries. That's why they call it a sand cherry and they're edible. So you're able to eat those and lots of animals like to eat them. Deer and other animals like to eat them as well, birds. Um, but you want to get them when they're ripe because when they're not ripe, they can cause you some, some problems with your stomach, but, but they are delicious. Um, I, at least I like them. So those along with several others, um, there's river grape, there's prickly pear cactus. Um, uh, what else is there? There's Arctic bearberry. These are some that I don't have on in the presentation, but all these different plants um, make up the diversity of that complex ecosystem, um, which is the dune, the dune area, the four dune, 
um, beach, the four dune and, and uh, what we call the, the Jack Pine complex there. So, so as you're going along, you're going to hit areas that are open like this prairie here. And we have what we call the Minoki Prairie, and it's it's one of those small remnants of prairie, as you probably know. We have less than less than one percent of the prairie area uh, that we used to have in the United States. And so, as the National Park Service, um, the prairie area that we do have, we try to um, try to preserve that as best that we can. You can see, um, I think that's Prairie Dock and some Blazing Star. I think there's some sunflower, prairie sunflower, and maybe some rattlesnake master in there. Um, so all these unique plants um, that you're not going to find when you're traveling, you know, I, I travel from, from here in Indiana and I travel through Illinois to Springfield where, um, where I was, grew up and, and went to school and everything where my home is. Um, and you don't see this. And, you know, a portion of Illinois at one time was prairie, right? And so to see this here at Indiana Dunes is very unique. And so that just shows you again, that diversity that we have here. It's just a small remnant, obviously, but it's special. These open areas like this field here, um, you know, they create an area for, for different types of animals to live. So um, you have, you know, your, your ground squirrels, you have hawks and owls and stuff that will hunt over this area. Deer will use this. Um, it's just a different type of ecosystem um, that provides um, butterflies, other insects, other mammals, um, and rodents with um, with a place to to survive. So we try to maintain this and other parts of the park. In fact, most of the parts of the park, there's a with the exception of a few, are maintained by fire. And that's one of the things that I think the public doesn't understand that most ecosystems um, need fire, period, periodic fire to maintain them. Um, fire puts nutrients back into the soil. It gets rid of invasives or, or plants that, um, uh, that, they, that don't need to be there, gets rid of those. Um, and it actually is, is healthy for the ecosystem. In fact, some, some plants, serotonous plants need, need uh, fire to actually produce to get their seeds to uh, disperse, right? So, so fire here at the National Park, we realized um, almost too late, <laughs> we realized that fire was a key part of, of ecosystems. And so along with our prairie and other um, woodland areas, we, we do periodic burns. We're, we're our fire team, which is a division of our resource management team. They go in and they, um, they set the, the woods on fire, they set the prairie on fire. And again, we have to go door to door um, in some cases and put out social media posts saying, hey, we're getting ready to do a fire and try to explain why, because there's so many times where people are coming up going, hey, those, those park rangers, they're burning down the woods again. They set Minoki Prairie on fire, what are they doing? You know, or they complain about the smoke. And, and so we have to um, warn people um, and explain to people that, hey, we're doing this for the betterment of the environment. And to be honest with you, the betterment of their, their um, property as well. Because, you know, people live their homes, but right up against the National Park Service property. And if we didn't maintain ours, if there was a wildfire, it could cause problems with that neighborhood or that home or that city. So we're doing our due diligence to um, not only protect the environment, make it better, but also to protect the uh, uh, towns and cities around us. So with the prairie and other, other um, ecosystems, plants have, have basically evolved to live with fire. And, and the prairie plants do that with these extreme, extremely um, intricate root systems, some that are, you know, over 10 feet deep, right? So you can burn over the top of them, <clears throat> excuse me, burn over the top, that nutrients goes back in the soil and you might think it's a wasteland, but those roots are still viable. And, um, you know, once the next growing season comes, boom, you've got these new plants that have all this nutrients and they're ready to grow. Same thing in the woodland areas, the same thing happens there. You get these seeds that are underneath the ground and all of a sudden um, it looks like the, the woods are devastated, but all these wildflowers start coming up in the spring. Um, and, uh, They've got all that nutrients that they can use to to um, to grow 
healthy and, and strong. The trees there in the oak savanna, um, they're very fire retardant. The thick um, bark on the trees uh, keep the fast, hot fires um, from burning the entire trees down. So, so again, as I said before, um, the beach community um, is where people, they come. They want to go to the water, right? They see Lake Michigan. And uh, I remember at one point, Lake Michigan, our beaches were in, um, I think it was the top 100 beach areas in the world because our sand, we had cleaned up and our sands were so nice. And of course there's no shark attacks, there's no jellyfish, things like that. So we were, we were in there, um, which was really nice. Um, but that's not the only um, wetland community, right? There's lots of different wetlands and that's a whole different habitat, um, these, these wetland communities. So, so the lake itself, huge body of water. Um, we like to go down and explore the lake. We have groups that we take down, students that we bring down from community schools to actually test the water because um, that water is, is life-giving. It's, it's water that we use to drink. We use to propagate our crops. We recreate in and on. Um, so we test the water and we show these students how um, we test the waters for different things and, and how clean or unclean uh, the waters of Lake Michigan and, and the surrounding areas are. So we like to do that. We like to immerse the communities that surround the park and live here in Northwest Indiana into the environment and get them to be stewards of the environment that way. Some of these wetlands um, are beautiful. You, know, you can see that um, they're, they're small pockets of, of um, water that different plants and animals can live around. Um, people like to recreate, go fishing and things like that. We've gotten to the point where um, we have crews that go into our streams and they um, get rid of the log jams. There's some, we, lead, we need to keep some log jams uh, and, and some riprap and, and things like that because of the macroinvertebrates um, and some of the endangered species that need that slow slowing of the current um, to, to, um, to help them survive but we also want to bring people into it and so we go in and we create these in our streams and rivers like the little calumet river um, and trail creek and, and many of the others that flow through it through the park and out of the park um, sand creek and others we go in so that so that people can navigate them in kayaks and canoes and so we've started doing those kind of programs to get people involved again in the environment around them and get them stewards of of um, of, the, of nature so these areas are great flyways. I think I talked about this before. You can see these open areas uh, adjacent to Lake Michigan where birds, as they're flying along, as they're going down the southern shores of Lake Michigan, um, doing the, the, the Great Lakes flyway, they, it, you know, they get tired and they're exposed. You know, think about it. You're out on the lake and a storm comes in. You're out exposed to, to the weather. If you can duck into one of these inner driven ponds like you see here, you get shelter, you get food, you get a respite from, from that flight, from that long migration. So these are key areas, excuse me, not only for the birds, um, but for the animals um, and other fish and things like that that live in the area as well. One of my favorite um, wetlands and most unique wetlands that you're going to find in the area is, is, is a bog. And we do have a true bog, which is called Pinhook Bog. I don't know if any of you have been there, um, but it's one of the areas that to get into the bog proper, um, you have to have a ranger to go in because the plants are so unique and so fragile um, that we don't allow people to just go in. Otherwise, the bog would, would be gone by now. Um, and so we do do open houses on the weekends and we do... Um, scheduled tours either through me or through some of the other rangers you can get a tour uh in the bog the best times to go in the bog are in the spring um may through june july is my favorite time to go in the bog because that's when the blueberries are in bloom um are, are ripe i should say and so a lot of times you'll if you're going on a program with me i'll be sitting there eating the blueberries um not doing much talking because the blueberries are so so delicious um but it's, it's a really neat place to, to see. And if you've never been to a bog, 
think about it. You don't have to travel far. It's right here in Northwest Indiana. Some of the uniqueness about the bog is the fact that you're walking on water. There's a um, just a, a mat of sphagnum moss and we, we lay a, a boardwalk on top of that mat of sphagnum moss. And underneath that two or three foot of fat sphagnum moss is anywhere to 30 to 40 foot of water. Now it's stagnant water because the moss is growing over it. And, and uh, so it kind of smells a little bit as you're walking through, but it's just amazing because the path just becomes very buoyant and where you're, it's almost like you're walking on a waterbed at times. And sometimes the water splashes up through the, the boardwalk. Um, so if you do happen to be able to get out on a tour and, and hike through um, the bog, be best to wear your, you know, shoes that you don't care about and you're not going to dress to the nines as far as going on a hike in the bog for sure. You want to wear clothes that you don't mind getting a little dirty. There we go. So the bog um, is unique to, to insect eating plants. And one of the main insect eating plants that you're going to see there um, is going to be um, the pitcher plant. And the pitcher plant, as you can see here, basically it's, it's shaped like a pitcher. And I don't know if you guys can see it close up from the from your view, but there's hairs inside the pitcher plant. So if an insect falls inside those hairs or falls inside the pitcher plant, it just falls down and there's water in there. The bottom of, the, of, of that water um, are protozoa and other things that are, that are living in there um, that basically eat and break down whatever falls in in the water. Well, when the insect falls in, whether it be an ant or a beetle, a small fly, it tries to crawl out. It's fine. It falls in. It's like, okay, I got to get out of here. And it starts to crawl out. And those irritating hairs hit its face, hit its body, and it keeps falling back in. And then after a while, it gets exhausted and it falls and drowns and sinks down to the bottom where these other organisms start to do their thing. So it's a kind of a symbiotic relationship that, that, the, that the pitcher plant has with other organisms inside it. And um, basically what happens is those organisms start to feed and uh, they get the pitcher plant uh, gets the residuals of that and uses that as its nutrients. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it does that is because, like I said, the substrate is, is sphagnum moss and underneath that is water. So there's not a lot of nutrients there. It's amazing that the plants that grow there are able to, um, like your white pines, um, your blueberries. Um, there's there's other lots of other different cotton eye grass or cotton grass, um, lots of different orchids and things like that that are able to grow on this mat of sphagnum moss. It's pretty amazing. This happens to be uh, the lady slipper orchid, one of the most beautiful. And so a lot of people come just to get this, take pictures and get this on their list of uh, wildflowers that they that they want to see. Um, very, very beautiful. In fact, there's for a while we were actually um, caging them. We were putting them in cages to keep them from people stealing them um, and to keep animals from eating them because they started to get to the point where, um, you know, we weren't sure we were going to have them anymore, but they are growing quite well there. Um, and Pinnock Bog is doing, doing pretty good. So as we talk about wetlands, let's talk about some of the animals that we're going to see in these wetlands and, and other places. Um, bullfrogs, frogs and toads. Um, these animals need wet areas to survive. Obviously, um, they need them to reproduce. Bullfrogs, especially um, green frogs, um, things like that, they're going to need to be in the water because that's where they, they're protected. Um, they have that porous skin and they use it um, as camouflage to hunt their, their food as well. They have um, these bullfrogs, they have tadpoles, right? And so that's the, the really neat thing about tadpoles is the fact that they don't look anything like a frog. They look like a weird looking fish, right? And that long tail basically, um, they, that goes away after a while. Um, and then legs start to get produced and the gills turn into to lungs and it uh, basically comes out on land. I've seen tadpoles as late as mid-December. I've actually seen them underneath the ice. I've had crusts of ice um, in late December uh, on ponds uh, and underneath the ice, tadpoles were moving around. These tadpoles can survive that um, that harsh weather, 
but sometimes they can't survive each other. You can see that mouth there. And a lot of times um, tadpoles will eat each other. They'll eat anything that's moving around and that, that's small enough to get into their mouth um, to, to survive. Um, so they're very voracious and luckily they're not that big or else we'd be in trouble, right? And same things with frogs and salamanders. They're, they're very voracious predators. Um, and I always think to myself, gosh, it's, it's so good that they're, they're small and we're big because we would have a big problem if these things were, were larger. So you can see these uh, tadpoles grow up into, the, into these frogs and the frogs, they are voracious as well, as I said. Uh, they'll eat fish and they'll even eat each other. So you can see that one's got a little, little frog in its mouth. Basically anything that will fit in its mouth, they'll eat. And the weird thing about, so, you know, so size really matters with frogs because we have um, bullfrogs at the Douglas Center in Miller Woods there, uh, Paul H. Douglas Center for Environmental Education. We have frogs there. And, and right now we're actually in a dilemma where we're trying to get one frog to, to eat and beef up because if it doesn't, it's not going to grow. It's, it's, it's not going to be big enough and it's going to get eaten by the other frog that's in there, which is a little bit bigger than he is. So, and we've had that happen, unfortunately, where we've, we've, um, we weren't monitoring the food intake and one frog grew faster than the other and ended up being dinner for the other frog. So we're trying to, we're trying to make sure that um, the one frog gets a little bit more food than the other. So it kind of grows in size so they don't eat each other. The really neat thing about how frogs feed, they use their big mouth and their tongue and they'll grab something and shove it in their mouth but then they use their eyeballs. You can see those big, huge eyes, those big, huge eyes that you see on the top of, the head, of its head, they're great for spotting prey moving around, um, but they also, uh, if you watch when they swallow, they close their eyes. So those big eyeballs actually crush and push the food back into their mouths. So it's just kind of a neat thing that uh, people don't know about frogs sometimes. Well, same thing with frogs that people don't know, frogs and toads when they hibernate because they, you know, they have to hibernate. They're not going to be able to survive all winter long um, uh, when it gets too cold. So what they'll do is a membrane will grow over their, their bodies. And in that membrane, they'll go down underneath the, the substrate, go in the mud and the muck, and uh, they will just overwinter there. Their whole respiration slows down, all their bodily functions slow down, um, and they're able to survive the winter that way. That's why when come springtime, we have frogs back and we have toads back. Um, but that's one of the really unique things about how they're able to, to survive the winter or hibernate. So one of the things that people um, always ask me when, when we're hiking, especially when it starts to get kind of, um, when we do night hikes or, or evening hikes, they ask about bats. And bats are extremely important to us. They're ex important exterminators of pests. Um, they're pollinators. Um, they're just actually cool, cool animals. Um, nothing to really be afraid of. Um, if you do see a bat, leave it alone because um, you don't want to get bit by it no matter what. And you, but you don't want to hurt it because, like I said before, like I said, they're very important to the ecosystem. Uh, little brown bats are one of the um, species that grow or that live here in, in Northwest Indiana. Um, and during this time of year, they're feeding. As you know, the insects are getting a little bit more active because it's towards that, um, getting towards fall and they know that they're not going to survive very long. So these insects are out moving around, they're active. Well, the bats are out. Last night I was hot walking my dog and I saw at least a dozen bats out flying around catching insects, um, doing their feeding. Um, so that's important. Now these bats, they're, they're doing the same thing. They're going to get themselves, um, fattened up. <clears throat> so, um, because they hibernate as well, actually some bats migrate, um, like the little Brown and others, they'll migrate South to hibernate where it's a little bit, um, a little bit easier to, to find areas and shelter to, to, um, to hibernate. Um, but they don't migrate that far. They're just going to fly further south and do do their migration and then then hibernate there. You can see that that basically you think bats have wings, but those are actually arms and legs. They're they're not wings. Um, they just have membranes that go across their arms and joints, um, their shoulders and their 
um, elbows and things like that. So that's, that way they can keep the flight. You see the huge ears. That's another thing that you can see um, are those big ears. And that's important um, because those ears, um, they use those for everything. But as I was saying about the ears with bats, um, echolocation is is basically the key to the bat survival. They can't they can't um, get their food or navigate um, in the darkness, right, in caves or through woods at night um, without echolocation. Their eyes are fine; they see about as well as we do. Um, but if you try to run through the woods at night, you'd be in a world of hurt, right? Well, the way they're able to fly and catch food and things like that is is with echolocation. So they're able to audibly or vocally um, make a noise that those sound waves bounce off of the trees, off of other bats, off of the insects, go back into the bats' uh, acute ears, right? And it's able to pinpoint where things are. So it's not hitting trees, it's not hitting other bats, it's finding its prey like mosquitoes, moths, um, and other flying um, insects. As if you ever get a bat locator, which they're they're fairly cheap and easy to, to get, um, just a simple one is very easy to get. You can get a real expensive ones that are thousands of dollars that can actually tell you the species of bat and everything. Or you can get the cheaper ones that um, that I have that I use. They uh, a series it comes with a series of clicks on your bat locator. So it'll start out with a click, 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 and then as the bat gets closer and closer to its prey, the clicks get really, really fast. So it starts this, I can't even do it. It's, it's so fast. So you know that at the end of that, all of a sudden the clicks stop. That means it's probably caught its prey and it's got a mouthful of food. Um, and that's, so that's how it goes. Now, these insects, especially most moths or certain species of moths, they've come up with um, a way to deter that right? A defense to that. So they can actually feel those sound waves hitting them on their hairs that they have. Well, as soon as those those um, sound waves gets more intense and quicker, all of a sudden the moth will just fold its wings and fall straight down and the bat misses the moth. Um, so it's a little bit of warfare there, a little cat and mouse with the bats and, and, and the moths. So in fact, it's kind of funny, we play this game with our kids um, when they come to the park, we play bat and moth and where you have one blindfolded kid in a circle, um, which is, is the bat. And then you have these moths and the bat says, as in the middle of the thing says bat. And then as soon as you, the moths hear the word bat, they have to say moth. And then he goes faster and faster, bat, 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 moth, moth, moth. And he just tries to find the moths as they're trying to move around and, and get away from the, um, uh, the bat. It's pretty neat. It's a neat game, and it kind of gives the gives the kids the idea of how echolocation works. It's pretty pretty fun. So if you see a bat on the ground, right, don't go and pick it up. Um, call someone if you don't know about bats or anything like that. If if there's no one around and you do want to remove the bat from the area, wear thick gloves because as you can see, um, the bat has very sharp teeth. Bats don't usually crawl on the ground that often, especially in the daytime when you might see, you know, happen upon a, a, a bat. Um, that might mean it's sick, it might have rabies, it might have some other kind of disease that you don't want to don't want to get. So call someone. Um, if you have to remove the bat, thick gloves, I've actually done it um, where, you know, I had one in, in my garage and I had to remove it from my garage. So I had to thick, um, thick gloves that I wore to remove the bat. And it did try to bite me. It wasn't going to, you know, and I had one in my office once that I had to remove out of uh, a heating or a air conditioned duct. And so I got it out and I released it. Um, and again, it tried to bite me. So they're going to do that. Beautiful animals, very, very fragile, um, but very, very beautiful. So that brings me to um, one of my favorite things, which is birds. And we do have different owls um, that are in the, in the park. And they're very, very neat to see. A lot of people um, might go their whole life without seeing an owl. And if you're lucky enough to see one, see one hunting, um, I'm lucky enough that where I live, I hear them in my backyard. I hear um, screech owls. I hear barred owls. 
Um, I even hear great horned owls um, where I live. And sometimes they fly across the yard. Um, and sometimes I see them roosting too. So it's kind of neat to see, see the owls. And so I'm gonna go through different species of owls that we have. This happens to be a screech owl. This happens to be a snowy owl. And all these owls that I'm talking about, um, you have the opportunity or the chance to see here in the dunes. This is a short-eared owl, great horned owl, which I heard, uh, was it last night or the night before in the backyard? Barn owl, and the barn owl is uh, fairly endangered. I, be I believe it still is. And barred owl, and this is the barred owl, not barn, but barred owl. Um, this is one of the most common. I see these a lot of times um, and hear them the most in the park. So the barn owl, it's one of those that have that, um, the reason it's got its name is because it loves to, to um, not exclusively, but but does like to, to be in barns. It's one of those owls that has the uh, eyes that it could sit in a barn and use it, use that barn as not only shelter, but a place to feed. Because as you know, barns, um, especially back in the day, would have plenty of mice in them because that's where you had your feed for your animals, seeds and things like that. So these, uh, these owls would sit in there and farmers knew. They're like, hey, this is a good spot for an owl to be. They didn't try to shoo the owl away. They kept the owl in there because uh, that was something that they, um, they wanted to keep in there um, to get rid of the, the pest, which would be the mice and the rats, right? So the next one is a snowy owl. And this is one that we see just about every year. Um, it's hard to glimpse because it's it's usually ones they come down from the Arctic and it's usually the young because they're being displaced by the adults and the older owls that have established themselves. And a lot of times it's because um, you see more of them in certain years than others because lemmings are, are, are their main food source at certain times of year. And, and the lemming population will fluctuate, fluctuate um, in the Canadian Arctic. And so these owls are moving down through this area, trying to find places to find food and territory themselves. They usually don't stay long. They usually head back up, um, up north. Um, but we have seen these, we usually have reports of these every year um, of snowy owls, beautiful birds. They have that white color, um, basically white year round um, to, to blend in with the Arctic and the tundra that they live on. Um, the, the other thing about this owl and one other owl, which is a short eared owl, is they are, um, they nest on the ground, they're ground nesters. So you have to kind of um, know where to look to find their nests if you are looking for them. This is the short eared owl. And again, this is one that nests on the ground. It's a smaller, it's one of the smaller owls. It's not as small as a screech owl, um, but it's one of our smaller owls. And again, all these owls do a great job at, at getting rid of uh, pest rodents and things like that are around our homes um, and around our, the buildings that we inhabit. You can see in this picture here um, the little owlets, and um, it's you can see the ground, the nest is on the ground. The only time that I've ever seen this on the ground and it was near its nest was at West Beach. I saw one as I was hiking uh, through an area of West Beach, and it was on the ground near a nest and I just left it alone. I didn't go near it because I didn't want to disturb its nest. Um, and it was kind of neat to see that. So so talking a little bit about the, the structure of an owl, you see this facial disc. There's a reason why owls have those, those facial discs like that. And that's to bring in light. Um, it brings in sound and light to kind of focus right in where the owl needs it to be. That's the um, the most sensory area of an owl is right in its face area for, for several reasons. This is where the owl is going to do most of its perception, right? So if we had, for instance, if we had eyes the size of an owl, our eyes would be the size of softballs. We'd be walking around with huge softball size eyes relative to, to our head. And these big eyes and their rods and cones bring in, they're able to focus and they're able to bring in that light. In fact, I read where you could put an owl on one side of a football field stadium, put a mouse on the other side of the stadium, put a candle in the middle, turn out all the lights, 
and the owl would have no problem finding the mouse. We'd probably barely be able to see the, the candle, let alone find a mice, found, find a, a mouse running around in the stadium. So that's how good the eyes are of these, uh, these owls. So again, that facial disc, bringing in the light, bringing in the sound. Owls have ears. These tufts that you see on the great horned owl and other owls, they're not the ears. The ears are, uh, are back in the, the, the folds of the feathers on the face, those facial feathers. And they do uh, what they call triangulation. So they have a, an ear that is kind of high and facing and, and set forward and another ear that's low and set back. And that, that way they can sit <clears throat> and they can hear something and they're able to get, get, get whether it's low on the ground, higher up in the tree, further away, to the right, to the left, behind them, or in front of them. So they're able to triangulate that and, and figure out exactly where their um, potential play, prey item might be. Speaking of that, we do this, this game with the kids as well, where we blindfold the kids, right? So they can't see. And then I have two sticks and I'll go from either side of their head and I'll tap the sticks. And it, you would think, you know, when you tap the sticks, you know, on either side of the person's head, you'd think you'd be able to tell exactly where it's at. But if you try it, Believe me, you don't. The kids are like pointing up, they're pointing down. They have no idea because we cannot triangulate. Our ears are set right on the sides of our head, kind of facing forward a little bit. And uh, it's very hard for us to triangulate. If you do it above their head, behind them, <clears throat> sometimes they point straight ahead. <laughs> sometimes if you do it in front of them, right in front of them, they'll point behind them. So um, it's kind of funny to, to do that. With practice, you can get it, but, um, but it's kind of funny and it, it just... Uh, kind of emphasizes that triangulation that the, that, the, that the owls can do. The other neat thing that they can do because of the vertebrae, construction of the vertebrae in their neck, is the fact that they can be sitting on a branch and they can turn their head around and look behind them, right? As you can see in this picture, the, the bird is facing away from us, but it's looking directly at us. Um, this, you know, is amazing because you know, when we want to look behind us, we have to turn. And sometimes when we turn, especially if you're a predator, if you turn around, you're going to make movement, right? So um, prey is, the potential prey will see that movement or hear that shuffling or whatever. Not with owls. They just turn their head. They don't have to move or anything. And so they can pretty much look all around them for, for prey. Another thing that makes them uh, quite deadly and, and, and proper predators is the fact that on their flight feathers, they have... Um, on the wings, they have um, serrated edges, and this helps with sound. Um, lots of birds, especially like pheasant and, and waterfowl and other birds, <clears throat> quail, when they take off, they make a lot of noise, that flapping of the wings. When an owl takes off, it's totally silent. You can't hear it. It glides by. Even when it's flapping its wings as it goes by, you, you don't hear it. So that's um, great for an owl to, to sneak up on prey. So if you can imagine, if you're a mouse and uh, you're doing your thing on the ground and it's dark and you're thinking, hey, I'm cool, I'm in the dark. Nope. If there's any type of light, starlight, uh, light from somebody's lamppost, uh, moonlight especially. I mean, it's like daylight for an owl if it's, if it's moonlight. Um, they're going to see you. You might think, okay, I'm hiding back here. Well, nope. Remember that owl can turn its head and you don't even know it's there. Then it launches off its perch in complete silence. So as a mouse, you have no idea that it's even coming. Last but not least, it has these talons that it brings out. And the cool thing about the talons is they are big and thick. And when they reach out and throw those talons forward, it takes them no effort at all. And this is for basically any most birds of prey or most birds for that matter. Uh, when they clamp down, it takes no pre no strength at all. They clamp down and they actually, with um, certain functions and, 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 and tendons, they lock down. The, 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 the um, talons will lock down. Now, it does take quite a bit of effort to unlock the talons. So whatever it catches, whether it might be a mouse, it might be um, a snake, it might be a rabbit, it's locked on there. And so that prey animal might struggle a little bit but it's not going anywhere. So again, those things make uh, the owl quite the predator. 
So this is uh, another cool bird that I get around my house and it's the ruby, ruby throated hummingbird. And uh, we've got lots of flowers uh, hanging at baskets and stuff around our house. And so we get these, um, these birds and you can see by this picture, it's not much bigger than my thumb. You can see the bee next to it. It um, just slightly bigger than a bee, um, but they're really cool because they are wing beats. They, they, they're, they, um, they're able to flap their wings so fast that they're able to move forwards and backwards. It's really kind of cool. They have to take in nectar and without that nectar, they would die pretty quickly. So they're always taking in nectar because they got such a, <clears throat> excuse me, high metabolism. And as small as they are, little thimble size nests and little pea sized eggs is what they produce. I wish I had a picture of, a, of one of the eggs, but um, it's amazing that such a small bird is able to um, move so fast and migrate. They do migrate. We throw throated, throated, uh, throated hummingbirds migrate into Cuba and South America. Um, and, you know, a small bird like that making a, such a big migration is amazing to me. It blows my mind. And, and of course, you know, on that migration, as of all birds, all birds, they have all these different obstacles that they have to go through, whether it be weather, whether it be man-made obstacles that they have to go through, predators, things like that. Um, these, these little tiny little hummingbirds have to go through all of that. And there's been, um, you know, documentation of hummingbirds landing on ships, right? Because they're going to take a break as they're flying across the ocean, excuse me, across big bodies of water. So, um, so yeah, hummingbirds are awesome and they're so beautiful. And you hear the buzz, there's a certain bu buzz that hummingbirds have, and you know the difference. If you're a birder, you know the difference between that and a bee and other insects. You're like, okay, that's, that's my hummingbird. Another animal that uh, people don't see very often in the park are beaver, and we have lots of those. They're, they're one of our aquatic rodents, um, one of the, the largest native aquatic rodent um, in North America. And um, we've had influx of, of beaver um, to the point where we've had to do research and our resource management people um, have to figure out how to manage beaver because they can change an ecosystem um, like no other, other than humans, <laughs> I should say, other than humans. Um, they can really put a change on an ecosystem. So they do this. They love to chew trees. And I've, come, I've walked up on trees where, you know, they've pretty much girdled the tree or all, the tree's about to fall down. And the reason they do that is a couple different reasons. One, they're trying to get to those small branches um at the top right because they're not really eating consuming some of this wood but but that's not the, what they want to consume they're trying to get to the smaller branches to consume those succulent uh leaves and and small branches and then also to make their lodges and dams you can see here that um you know beavers can make substantial dams and lodges in fact i remember i do a lot of fishing and i and uh, I go up north, up to Wisconsin and Minnesota do, to do fishing and even up into Canada sometimes. And I remember one year I was up there and I actually, we came upon a beaver lodge that was about the size or larger than my living room. It was huge and we could stand on top of it and we were catching fish off of it. And that's another thing that, that, that beaver do is they, in, in the aquatic habitats that they live in, they, they actually create fish habitat where fish can go in and spawn, they can go in and find places to hide from predators and food sources go in there as well so they can feed. Um, I'm sure the beaver aren't trying to do that, but um, when they're making their homes, that's what happens. Um, here in Northwest Indiana, we have problems with beavers for two reasons. One, our resource management have problems with them because we're trying to keep our wetlands um, keep them flowing, keep them viable, right? And so beaver tend to change the, the hydrology of areas um, if, there, if there are too many in there. Um, we don't have the predators that would normally be here for beaver, right, in the numbers that we need. We have coyotes and, and things like that, but we don't have the mountain lions, we don't have grizzly bears, we don't have as many uh, 
eagles and things like that. So the predators that would be there to keep that beaver population down is, isn't there anymore, right? So unfortunately, in the oak savanna, we were having issues with the hydrology there where the beavers were actually making, uh, causing problems with some of our um, native aquatic plants. Um, the water was getting flowed to different areas that it wasn't supposed to, um, draining from areas that, it, that the water should be and things like that, and eating our, our um, chewing down all our oaks, all the black oaks. There's, if you look, if you're hiking through Miller Woods, you'll see around any wetland area, there's usually most of the trees along there are chewed down or it's chewed on, if, if not chewed down along the wetland area. Um, the other part of that is the fact that people in residential areas, the beaver population got so big that they're starting to move into our neighborhoods and they're starting to dam up our creeks and streams and, and even man-made waterways and people's yards and basements and homes are flooding. So that's another thing as far as trying to remove the, the beaver from the area. They're busy and uh, hence the, the phrase busy as a beaver, right? They, they do their work. Get to something a little bit more cute um, per se, and those are squirrels. We have several different squirrel species um, that run through the park. Um, and they're, you know, we have gray squirrels that, that they're the ones that are most active. When you, when you see a squirrel, usually it's usually going to be a, a gray squirrel. Um, they're extremely active and, and um, very aggressive. Um, they're the ones that are going to be uh, burying their nuts, running around making caches of nuts in different places. I remember sitting in my office and two gray squirrels, they were, they would run out. It was snow on the ground. They would run out. They would bury their nuts in the ground and they'd run back. Uh, they'd sit around for a little while, gra grab some more, go and bury them. And lo and behold, there was a blue jay sitting up in the tree in a branch, just watching, just watching the whole thing. And later on in the afternoon, I looked over and that blue jay was diving down right where the squirrels had, had uh, tried to bury their nuts. And he was popping up out of the snow with, with acorns. It was hilarious. I was laughing. I'm like, oh, these guys must be mad. And you could hear him yapping at the, at the, uh, the blue jay. It was funny. Another one is the fox squirrel. It's the biggest squirrel. Um, but again, that fox squirrel, you know, it doesn't like gray squirrels. The gray squirrel is so much more aggressive that if there's a fox squirrel and you have gray squirrels moving into the area, the fox squirrel is going to move out. It's not going to be, it's, it's, it's not going to take the time to battle or, or fight with that, with that gray squirrel. So these guys, um, they make drays and big, huge, if you see a big, huge ball of leaves um, up in a tree, it's called a dray and that's where they, they stay. Usually <clears throat> the females have the dray, bigger drays and they're lower to the ground. The big are the smaller drays that are up high and they're usually not formed very well. They're really kind of raggedy. Those are usually the males and usually bachelor males that have their little, their bachelor pad up high in the tree. Um, and they use those in the wintertime for protection. Um, sometimes they'll store nuts in there too, but for the most part, they're making caches and storing their nuts um, on lower areas of, of the ground. This is one of my favorites. And when I do night hikes in the summertime, I love to see this guy. And this, these are flying squirrels. And so they have a membrane that goes from one arm to the leg and the other arm to the other leg, and they don't actually fly, they glide. So they'll get to a high point and to fly to another tree or to glide down to another tree, they'll jump off and they'll spread that membrane out. They'll spread their arms and legs out and that membrane will catch the wind and they'll glide over to the next tree. And it's kind of neat. You see how big those eyes are. Well, that's because <clears throat> it's nocturnal. It's not gonna, it's not gonna fight um, for food sources with the other two squirrels, with the gray squirrel and the uh, fox squirrel, it's going to wait and come out at night and just take whatever food that it wants. So it has to have those big eyes so it can see and glide around the trees at night. Otherwise, it'd crash into the tree, right? So and, and look out for predators like owls, right? So, um, so that's why the eyes are so big. You can see that these squirrels are smart. They like to sit on uh, fences, like to get to your bird feeders. Um, if you have a bird feeder, good luck. 
trying to stop squirrels from getting there. I don't know um, anyone that hasn't. I know some people that are pretty successful keeping squirrels away, but I don't know anyone that's 100% successful keeping squirrels out of their, their bird feeders and stuff like that. But they're really neat to watch. They're very smart animals. Um, and they're neat to just see. One time I was, I do a lot of deer hunting. And so I sit up in a tree and I remember um, sitting up in a tree one time and thinking I'm, you know, I'm sitting there waiting for a deer to come by and a bunch of squirrels were like, nope, not today. You're not doing that. And they got extremely aggressive, extremely aggressive to me to where they were running down the tree and throwing acorns at me. They're literally throwing acorns at me. And I'm like, this is crazy. And I got so frustrated that I ended up leaving. So the the, the little squirrels beat me. <laughs> they, they beat me up. They, throw, they were chattering at me. I'm like, well, deer aren't going to come by now with all these squirrels chattering anyway. And now they're throwing acorns at me. You got to be crazy. You know? Oh, and I was, yes. And I was talking about how they were able to get on. You can see how um, they're able to get on uh, the bird feeders and things like that. And some people just give up and go ahead and feed the squirrels. And I, that's what I usually do too. I usually just give up and, and put a little section there. And that's the best way to do it. Have a little section for the squirrels. So that way they're not eating all the seed from the, um, from the, for the birds. Oh, this is a great picture showing how the uh, flying squirrel um, has the membrane out and it glides from tree to tree. That's awesome. So snakes, I mean, people fear snakes. I don't know of any animal that people fear more than snakes, right? Because you can't see them, you usually can't hear them, and you're just terrified of them, right? And so snakes come in all different sizes and shapes, right? Everything from your reticulated python to your lowly um, garter snake, right? Um, so snakes feed in different ways. Some are, are um, restrictors, and so they, they restrict their prey. Um, and then some, um, they use venom, right? So they're pit vipers and they use venom. Um, and so this one here, this happens to be a rattlesnake, and we do have one species of rattlesnake in the area. It's called the Masasaga or pygmy rattlesnake, a uh, small, small rattlesnake. Um, and they, so Basically, with that, they use their um, their teeth. It's 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 it, one of their set of their teeth are formed to um, deliver venom, right? So they use that to subdue their prey. They don't want to get up close and personal like a um, python would, or or um, a hognose snake, or maybe even a, a fox snake or a black rat snake. These snakes, the ones that um, wrap around, they have to get up close and personal, right? These guys are like, hey, look, I don't want to have to struggle and wrestle around with my food. I'm going to bite it back off and let the venom do the work, right? So they're called pit vipers because they also have heat seeking pits um, underneath their eyes. And so that way they can track their prey in the dark. It doesn't have to be light outside. It could be dark outside. And that heat signature from that animal, they can track that and, and find their prey that way. So some, there are some um, pythons that have heat-seeking pits as well. Those are the ones that are tree pythons, and they live up in trees, and so they can catch birds and animals that are swinging around in trees, monkeys and other things. So they can get that heat signature, and they can reach out and grab something. But as you can see with this reticulated python, what they're going to do, they don't have fangs. So what they're going to do is they're going to grab something, and they're going to wrap around. And most of the time, these big ones like this, now we don't have, now I'll let you know this, we don't have reticulated pythons around here. We don't have anacondas, you know, ball pythons, anything like that. So these guys, they're lucky that thing's in a cage because as big as it is, it's probably over 10 foot, maybe 12, 12 foot or more. Um, it could eat those young men. They, they, it would eat them. It would, it would wrap around, squeeze them to death and eat them. And that's what basically they do. If you're, um, a mouse or something and a fox snake comes up or a black rat snake, it grabs them with their teeth that are pointing backwards. All their teeth in, on snakes, including the fangs, um, which are just modified teeth, 
to deliver venom, like I said before, um, they're pointed backwards. And there's a reason for that. Once they grab on, they don't want that, that prey to be able to get out of the mouth again, right? So they grab on and then they quickly coil around that animal and squeeze. Squeeze so tight that air can't be, that they can't breathe anymore. They can't bring in any air um, and they're crushing bones and things like that at, at the same time. Once the animal's dispatched that way, then they're able to basically crawl over the animal with their backwards pointing teeth. They crawl over it and they um, consume their prey whole. Now, there's a couple benefits to doing that, right? Snakes, now, of course, this reticulated python is probably not on the list as an adult is not on the list for many animals to eat, right? But young reticulated pythons and, and most snakes are eaten by other animals, eaten by other snakes, eaten by raccoons, eaten by hawks and owls. Lots of animals will eat snakes, right? And so they wanna get their food source, get it down quickly, and then go hide somewhere and, and stay there for a long period of time. So they're able to unhinge their jaws and eat something twice the size of their head, sometimes three times the size of their head, and take that food source down they don't have to go out and eat again, so they're not exposed to, to, to predators that way. And in that small package, they've got all the moisture that they need, too, so they don't have to drink water. One of the coolest snakes that we have, and scariest snakes, I would probably have to say, is the hognose snake. A lot of times people think that the hognose snake is a cobra because it, it flattens its neck out, it raises up slightly and will strike and hiss, right? So that's, that's its way of deterring predators. Because again, like I said, a lot of these snakes are food sources for other animals. Um, not venomous at all, rarely bites at all. Um, but yet and still, you don't want to pick it up. A couple reasons you don't want to pick it up. If you, if you stick around and you mess with that snake and it can't get away from you, it's going to flip over on its back and it's going to turn, play dead. And it's going to actually start smelling and secreting um, a really nasty, um, basically bowel movement is what it is. And if you're like me, I've actually done that. I've actually picked them up when they flipped over and everything. Then you flip them back over, they come out of their trance and then they start spraying that, that foul odor all over you. And basically you come home and your wife is like, take your clothes off outside because you're not bringing that stuff in the house because it stinks so bad. It smells basically like dead or, or rotten meat. It's, it's gross. And of course, that's going to deter any animal, right? You go to eat it, and all of a sudden, it smells like something's dead, and you got it all over you, you're going to go the other way. Um, a lot of times, just being dead alone and stinking, um, it gets away with not even being touched because an animal um, doesn't even want to mess with it. Okay, so any questions? We do have some questions in chat. Oh, okay. Okay. We deal with um, the same thing, just what is your contact information and your your office. So they would like to check into the tours and the classes offered. Okay. So um, the best way to get a hold of me is my, my work number is 219-395-1858. And I'm um, the outreach program coordinator at the Paul H. Douglas Center for Environmental Education. And that's off of Lake Street in Miller, Indiana, there in Gary. My email is Kipton, that's K-I-P-T-O-N underscore Walton, W-A-L-T-O-N at N-P-S dot G-O-V. That's N-P-S dot G-O-V, G-O-V, National Park Service dot gov. All right, thank you, Kipton, for all that helpful information. Okay. Well, thank you for having me and I uh, hopefully you, everyone enjoyed the, the presentation.